Good afternoon. Uh, you're very welcome to the latest in our series of webinars celebrating 20 years of the European Social Survey. This afternoon, we have four speakers or four papers, um, all dealing with the European Social Survey as a time series analysis vehicle. I'm very much looking forward to these talks. So that the format will be that each of our papers will take something around 20 minutes. And unless there are uh, really vital points of clarification, we'll move straight on to the next paper. There is a quite lengthy period of time set aside at the end of the event for a set of questions and answers. And at that point, I will ask all the speakers to uh, come on camera and be available to field those questions. Those questions I shall hopefully be selecting from the list in the Q&A function on Zoom. So uh, as we go through the papers, if you could enter your questions using the Q&A function, and I will sift through those and get through as many of those as I can uh, at the end of the proceedings. Given the fact that we're going to roll up all the questions into a single session, it would also be useful if you make it clear in your question uh, which paper your question pertains to. Thanks very much. So without further ado, I'm going to move to our first uh, scheduled speaker, who is uh, Ricardo De Leo from the One March Institute. Uh, so Ricardo, if you'd like to uh, kick us off uh, and you have the floor, I'm going to ask all the speakers uh, to introduce themselves. I think they'll get the, gives them the opportunity to have the introduction that they fully deserve. You're very welcome, you have the floor. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much for the introduction. I hope you can see my screen and you can hear me properly. Um, so I'm, um, first of all, Professor Harrison, thank you very much for the invite and thank you very much to all the participants and everyone who's here. Um, I am Ricardo Di Leo. I'm a postdoctoral uh, researcher at the Universidad Carlos III de Madrid and at the Carlos III One March Institute. I work broadly speaking on public opinion. I re recently got my PhD in economics at the University of Warwick. Uh, and um, the paper I'm going to present you today uh, in the 20 minutes I have is a project that has been recently published on the American Journal of Political Science and is joint work with Vincenzo Bove at the University of Warwick and Marco Gianni at King's College. London. And um, this paper is about the, um, is about the um, role that the military, military conscription, the draft, so to say, uh, can play in affecting institutional trust, trust towards the democratic institution that the military is expected to serve. And we study this question focusing on 15 countries in the European uh, area. Uh, using European social survey data, of course, and focusing on these countries that have suspended indefinitely or abolished their conscription programs. So, um, conscription seemed to be like a relic from the past, uh, at least for a while, and luckily so, some would say, uh, but still 60 countries worldwide as of 2019 were still having an active conscription program. And recently, uh, even before the invasion of Ukraine, several countries had already started to reintroduce military conscription out of geopolitical concerns. Uh, Ukraine, Georgia, and Lithuania were already considering introducing the draft after, uh, before uh, Russia's, uh, Russia's invasion, Norway has extended conscription for women, Sweden had reintroduced conscription shortly after disbanding the program, and uh, since the invasion of Ukraine, Latvia and Lithuania have re reactivated their programs, Poland was considering doing so up until a few weeks ago when they suspended the, the, this process. But for example, the Netherlands is uh, considering reactivating the program. And in Germany, it's an active debate uh, at the moment. Uh, and uh, one of the members of the executive, one of the ministers has, uh, has labeled the decision of, uh, of, of disbanding conscription in 2012 uh, as a mistake. So, 
conscription is having probably a comeback. But whilst geopolitical concerns are surely uh, important, an important motivation behind the behind the, the, the return of such policy, the argument that many policymakers are advancing to reintroduce the draft is this idea of combating a lack of mature public engagement. So the Service National Universal that has been recently launched in France and also uh, the Italian idea of re-establishing re the conscription have all, have all been justified with the idea that reactivating conscription would kind of reinforce the tie between the youth and the state and so kind of regenerate this proximity between the citizens and the state. And this is actually what we investigate in our paper. Um, why trust towards the institution is important? Well, because we know that for decades now, there's been a substantial decline in trust towards the institution. So to the point that Citrin and Stoker spoke of a cynical age we live in, an age in which trust towards the others and towards the institution is at its historical low. And if we know a lot about the factors that impact such trust. It is partly the byproduct of long-term trends. For example, a decline in social capital is generally associated with a decline in trust towards the institution, but also short-term fluctuation, the economic crisis, or the performance of the government in charge, of course, have also, also an impact on trust towards elected institutions, parties, and so on and so forth. And trust is really key for a democratic state, because if one trusts the institutions of a state, it will be more willing to participate in active politics. It will have different policy preferences because trust towards, for example, elected bodies means also that there is more trust towards the vision, towards the agenda of the party uh, in charge. And also there is a link between trust and compliance with regulation. We have seen, for example, that during COVID, Compliance with the with the anti-COVID with the with the with the policies aimed at tackling COVID, including lockdowns, was higher. Where trust was the institutions was uh, higher. So the question of our paper is really whether military conscription as an institution, as a spirit of service that male young citizens had to endure, was helpful in reducing the distance between the citizens and the state. On the one hand, side, conscription has been shown to boost patriotism, for example, but on the other side, we don't know whether this patriotism actually transfers into trust towards the institution, into trust towards democratically elected bodies. So when you are serving for the army, patriotism and this sense of obligation for, for towards the state might boost trust towards the institution, towards the very the pillars of a country, but on the other side, this exposure to military norms, to the military routine, to this very hierarchical, vertical, non-democratic um, system that rules the military, that governs the military, well, what, this kind of exposure to this kind of system at very sensitive at a very sensitive age might foster identification with the armed forces rather than with democratically elected body that may appear as undesirably un, un, inefficient compared to this uh, alternative uh, alternative scheme, uh, so to say. So. As I was saying, we focus on 15 countries that have abolished conscription between 61 and 2012. As I was saying, Germany was the last one, uh, at least in our sample. Um, and you can see that there is a bunching of a bunch of reforms taking place in the early 2000s, especially in Eastern Europe. Uh, but this is kind of the full set of reforms. So just to give you an idea, we focus on Europe, broadly speaking, and on peacetime years. So in this period, the conscripts were not expected to serve in military ground. So it's really uh, the idea of be serving the state and being isolated for a number of months from civic society at large. In terms of the data we employ, we take data from National Toronto, which we expand uh, and, and, and using data from War Resistance International, an NGO studying conscription and, and the military in general. To get from this data, we get the year in which conscription was abolished. From the CIA World Factbook, we retrieved the year at which people were expected to serve in each country. So to get an idea of when 
the which court was the one serving under the under the military. And finally, we use the European Social Survey, the first nine waves, to gather data on individual level institutional trust. How do we measure institutional trust? Institutional trust is just the first component of a principal component analysis between four items of the questionnaire, trust in the legal system, in the parliament, in parties, in politicians. The results I will show you hold for these four items separately, but for the sake of conciseness, I will just merge these three, uh, three trust towards these four elements uh, in a single index uh, that captures each of them separately. From the sample, we draw professional militaries, no residents, no citizens, but most importantly, individuals with a university degree. Why is that the case? Because in the literature, it has, it has been shown that, for example, at the time of the Vietnam draft in the US or in Argentina um, during the, the dictatorship, basically, there was a strong incentive to enroll in university in order to postpone or entirely avoid the draft. And so we drop the sample of individuals, the ones with a higher degree, because there is a high chance, or I mean, there is a chance that they may have gotten the degree to avoid being drafted. And so we don't know exactly whether they had or had not uh, been drafted. There is a chance that they had avoided the draft. And so we drop them from the sample, but results are robust also when we reinclude them uh, as we show in the robustness test. So combining all these sources, we have around 100,000, uh, 160,000 individuals from 15 European countries. Now, the strategy we follow is, uh, uh, is a regression discontinuity design. This is a strategy that has been used widely uh, in social sciences, for example, to study the impact of uh, educational reforms. So what we do is we compare men that were just young enough to avoid conscription, so that they reached the pivotal age right after the reform, to men that were just old enough to be conscripted. So basically, we compare basically, ideally, the last bunch, the last court being drafted to the first court being non-drafted. And by doing so, using this regression discontinuity design, we are comparing men that are similar in their levels, ideally of trust and social political uh, background, but differ just in whether they were eligible or not to draft. The good thing about the, this policy uh, is that historically, and in the cases we are studying, it was a gender policy. So we expect that if we do the same exercise on the same course, but looking at women, we will not find a comparable, a comparable effect on institutional trust. And this is indeed what we find. So women are not a counterfactor, but still can help us as a, as a, as a comparison group. And we expect the end of conscription not to have any direct effects on women that were not drafted, of course. And the hypothesis we have is that the year, so we're not assuming that the date of the reform is random. We are just assuming that the date in which I am born, so my birth year, is as good as random compared to when the reform abolishing conscription was enacted, which we think is a reasonable, reasonable assumption. We, this is the specification we run. We use wave and counter fixed effect. And as we said, we focus on individual very, very close to the year of abolition. And this is our main result. So we show in figure in sub figure A that individuals that were just able to avoid conscription exhibit higher level of institutional trust. And this is actually the contrary of what pundits arguing to reintroduce conscription are uh, arguing. So there is a deep increase in trust if people didn't do their, their, their conscription period didn't, weren't drafted, so to say. And the interesting part is that once we look at women, we find no effect on trust of the reforms and in conscription. So it's really a male only effect, as we would expect. We run a number of robustness tests. Uh, for to, to test the validity of the regression discontinuity. We test uh, to the robustness to a number of bandwidths, polynomial orders, kernels, sampling. Uh, we re-include people with a university degree, as I was mentioning before, and the, re the results we find seem to be particularly robust. Um, and then we look into some heterogeneities to understand where uh, and how this mechanism, this, 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 this effect unfolded. So first of all, we compare former members of the Warsaw Pact, 
us, so let's say, broadly speaking, Eastern Europe to Western Europe, and see if the effect was stronger in this in this in the in the former case. What do we expect the effect of on institutional trust to be stronger in Warsaw Pact countries? Because these countries were defined as flow democracies, so to say. So the level of corruption were, was particularly high. But most importantly, we were coming uh, from the collapse of the Soviet Union. And so the, change, the, the abolition of military conscription was accompanied by a number of different changes in labor military policy. So the end of conscription was part of a broader process of reform. And so we expect, as we find, that the effect of the abolition of conscription on institutional trust is stronger in Eastern Europe. And indeed, this is what we find in our, in our paper. The second thing we check is the graduality of the phase out. So we gather data from the military balance and the European labor force survey to understand exactly what was the phase out of the, of the policy. So we look at, we know the approval date of the reform, the enactment date, and we know the number of conscripts between these two dates. So to give you an idea, uh, in, in Belgium, the reform was approved in 2001 uh, sorry, in, in, 19, in 1992, and by 1995, when the reform was actually enforced, there were no active conscript. So we can compute for each country the graduality of the phase out, which in France was very low, so there were conscript between adoption and uh, enactment, while in Germany, for example, the adoption and enactment date basically coincided and there was a sudden drop. Now, why is this important? Because what happens is that in cases where the, the drop, the, the, the enactment was sharp, all the people that we consider conscripts in our papers, so the members of the control group, so to say, are going to be likely conscripts. Instead, in cases where the phase out was very uh, was slow moving, many could have avoided conscription. And so as a result, the effect should be smaller, the coefficient should be smaller, because there is a higher chance that those that we consider conscripts were actually not being drafted, because the state was not so eager to follow them and to and was maybe happier to give them exemptions and so on and so forth. And indeed, what we find is that in, where countries approve the policy sharply, so from one year to the other, the treatment effect is higher, which is consistent with the idea of this stronger attitudinal homogenization coming from the being conscript rather than avoiding the draft. Another thing we, we check is whether the treatment effect varies depending on the timing of the reform. And as we would effect, expect, if the reform is closer to the interview date, the effect we measure is stronger because of course the experience or having avoided this experience is a fresher memory compared to reforms that took place earlier on. We check heterogeneity with the socioeconomic background of the individual and indeed we find that the effect is actually stronger uh, on trust among people with a high educated father, so from a, let's say, wealthier or better off uh, background. And finally, we use data from Parlgov about the ideology of the government approving the reform, and we find that there is no heterogeneity based upon whether the reform was approved by a left-wing or a right-wing government. So ideology doesn't seem to be at play here. Just to before concluding, an idea of the mechanism to explore. So the first mechanism we explore is the one that military scholars have defined as the civil military gap. So we, as I was mentioning in the beginning, there is a gap between how the, the world views of the military and of civil society. And in particular, it has been shown that the military may exhibit disparaging attitudes towards civic institutions, which may be judged as inefficient, as too slow, uh, compared to the vertical, fast decision-making process, but ultimately non-democratic process of the army. Uh, and so this exposure to the military community at the age of 18, 19, among young men, uh, this continue, these continue, these routines, this kind of, uh, uh, um, this kind of segregation from civic society may increase the uniformity of the worldviews among the community of conscripts. And indeed, what we find is that people that were conscripted exhibit a lower variance 
in their in their institutional trust compared to people that were able to avoid the draft. So in other words, there is a substantial a substantially higher degree of heterogeneity in views towards the institutions among the non conscript so this seems to suggest that when you when people were under the army drafted this this kind of exposure to this uniform community was able in kind of um, shrinking the, the the variation the variance in the attitudes of the these young men towards the state we do not retrieve any of the effect I was discussing before about educational attainment. Why is that? So the, the point is that on the one hand side, the end of conscription meant that there is an opportunity to develop skills because it's one year left less to be spent in the army and one year more that one could potentially employ in education. But on the other side, as I was mentioning before, the end of the draft also could be could have a negative effect on educational incentives, because of course, not having this avoidance mechanism of enrolling into university to avoid the draft, the incentive to enroll, uh, to, to enroll in university becomes slower. And what we find is that indeed there is no effect of the end of conscription on years of completed education, again, coming from the European Social Survey, so suggesting that in peacetime in Europe, there was no effect of conscription on educational incentive in the 15 countries we, we are studying. And finally, we want to check whether what we capture is generalized institutional trust or rather circumstantial uh, or the byproduct of circumstantial events. So we combine three elements, uh, two, 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 two outcomes about government performance at the time of the survey. And again, we find no effect of the reform on the circumstantial government performance at the time of the interview, suggesting that the effect we measure on institutional trust is indeed something broader and something that is not specific to the interview, but rather something that seems to be more stable. So to wrap things up, in this paper, we show that military conscription entails a significant civil military gap. Uh, and this uh, gap between these two institutions that characterizes in a decrease in trust among conscripts uh, compared to people that did not experience the, the military uh, is unfolds through an increased heterogeneity in the attitudes among people that were able to avoid the, the, the conscript. So once again, people that were conscripted at 19, 18, exposed to the army, exhibited lower trust towards the institution and more homogeneous attitudes towards the institution. So there is a, at the same time a lowering and an homogenizing of the individual attitudes. And we think that our paper gives three contributions. The first one is studying institutional trust rather than the impact of conscription on socioeconomic scores, crime, ideology, nation building. We think that the focus on institutional trust is particularly important, as I said, in times of declining uh, rates. Secondly, we combine a quasi-experimental regression discontinuity approach, which has a strong internal validity, with a comparative design. So we focus on 15 countries, which increases the external validity. And finally, compared to other papers that have done so in the past, uh, especially on single country studies, we focus on peacetime years. And we argue that this is important because the incentives that this conscript face, face is much are much different once when the when they're expecting to go on the front or when instead they're expected to just spend one year in the army without actual fight. And finally, we contribute to the policy debate on whether reintroducing the conscription could be a way to solidify the relationship between citizen and state. Our answer is that probably this is not the case. A new and more innovative uh, ways of tackling the problem of declining trust especially among the youth in declining participation, especially among the youth, should be pursued. Thank you very much for your attention. And of course, I'm looking forward to the Q&A session. Thank you very much, Ricardo. That was a fascinating paper and quite an ingenious little piece of analysis. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much. Our second paper this afternoon is from Radka Hanslova from the Czech Academy of Sciences. Radka, you have the floor. Thank you. I will share my screen. 
Everything is okay? Did you see my screen? Yes. Okay. See. Okay. So good afternoon. Thank you for for introducing me. Uh, I'm very pleased to have the opportunity to present the result of my research at this webinar held to celebrate 20 years of the ESS. I am a postdoctoral researcher at the Institute of Sociology of the Czech Academy of Sciences. And in my presentation today, I will focus on the topic in which I deal with my PhD studies. It is the topic of subjective well being, or rather its subdimensions, namely happiness and life satisfaction. As for the structure of my presentation, at first I will give you a brief theoretical introduction to the topic. Then I will discuss how the happiness and life satisfaction are measured in the ESS. And the main part of my presentation will be devoted to presenting the results. So let's start briefly with the theory. Subjective well-being is an important topic of our time that affects uh, people's quality of life. It is also a very discussed topic, both in terms of theory, which means how to define subjective well-being, but especially how to measure it. In the recent year, there is a prevailing view that the subjective well-being is a multidimensional concept and thus must be measured. However, very often we can find that subjective well-being is measured uh, only one simple questions on happiness or life satisfaction, which is uh, neither which is neither theoretically nor methodologically correct, because these are only subdimensions of subjective well being and must be analyzed independently. It is also incorrect uh, to consider these two concepts synonymous, because as you will see later, the results of the answer to these questions differ. Happiness, uh, happiness is usually defined as a people's emotional response that measures their current feelings and life satisfaction, on the other hand, could be defined as a cognitive and global evaluation of the quality of one's life as a whole and life satisfaction is considered to be more, st to be more stable and permanent state. According, according to OECD methodology, subjective well-being in the research should be uh, also uh, should be always measured by at least four questions: one on positive emotions such as happiness, one on negative emotion uh, such as anxiety, fear, or sadness, one on life satisfaction, and one on the eudaimonic aspect of subjective well-being, which means uh, psychological well-being, uh, which can be referred as um, meaning and purpose. In this slide, you can see how this is conceptualized, this measurement in OECD methodology. And now let's move on to how Life satisfaction and happiness is measured in the European Social Survey. In European Social Survey, uh, happiness and life satisfaction are measured by one simple question. Uh, the, both these questions are part of a core module and are included in each round of the ESS. So in total, there were asked, there were interviewed for 10 times. The, moreover, in round three and six of the ESS, uh, there was included a rotating module on personal and social well being that is also will be repeated again in round 12. And in this module, uh, these modules uh, contain uh, much more questions uh, in this topic of subjective well being. 
the wording of the questions you can see on these slides. On this slide, the respondents answer on both questions on an 11 point response scales from zero extremely happy to 10 uh, extremely happy or uh, zero extremely dissatisfied to 10 extremely satisfied. Before I proceed to present the results of my research, I would like to say a few words uh, about the data and method I used. Uh, as my aim was to analyze the data over time, in my analysis, I only included countries that participated at least eight rounds uh, of the 10 rounds of ESS. In total, it was these 19 countries. Uh, the ranking of countries by happiness and life satisfaction is based on mean scores on an 11 point response scales in each round and testing differences by various variables are, uh, are based on mean scores and correlation from aggregated data from all rounds for on for uh, for on for all analysis the anal analytical weights uh, were applied and now, uh, exactly, I proceed to the presenting my results. Yes, the results. Uh, if we look at the results, or rather the graphs, uh, we can see some general trends. First, the levels of happiness and life satisfaction is relatively stable and constant for uh, over time for most countries. Of course, uh, there are some uh, exceptions, such as Hungary, where the values have been increasing, slightly increasing from round four to round 10, uh, and also Estonia, where is evident a steady slight increase from the beginning from round two. It's also worth mentioning Ireland, where the values of values of happiness and life satisfaction uh, will be uh, was decreasing until around five and then start increase slightly. Uh, the, re uh, the trend is reversed for Poland where the values will be slightly increasing until around eight and then start uh, decrease. The, also, uh, for a few countries, there is a significant, uh, significant increase in mean score of happiness in mean scores of happiness and life satisfaction in the last round ten. It is an it is an example. It is an uh, example for uh, for example, Spain, Sweden, or Germany. But um, uh, but this may be due to the different method of data collection because in these countries was um, the data collection was carried out by self completion method uh, because of a COVID nineteen pandemic. So in in later years we'll see it is the impact of uh, data collection or it is a significant trend in change of the uh, value of happiness and life satisfaction. The second, uh, the second main trend is that the level of happiness in blue uh, is slightly higher than the level of life satisfaction in yellow for most countries. However, in recent rounds, for uh, for both values have been equalized for for some countries for example for example hungary portugal or slovenia or even the average life satisfaction value has exceeded the happiness happiness value it is the it is the example of of czechia or switzerland if we look directly uh, at the values themselves, we can generally conclude that the highest mean scores of happiness and life satisfaction is um, 
are in the Nordic countries such as Denmark, Finland, Norway or Sweden, but uh, also in Western European countries such as Switzerland or Netherlands. On the other hand, the lowest level of happiness and life satisfaction are in Central and Eastern European countries such as, such as Czechia, Estonia, Hungary or Poland. Now I would like to very briefly return to my comment from the introduction that happiness and life satisfaction cannot, cannot be considered the same concept. Also, in some countries, the values are almost identical, uh, which is also uh, very il well, well illustrated by the correlation value, which is very high for all countries, more than 0 0.5. Uh, in others, such as, such as France, po uh, Portugal or, uh, or Hungary, there is a difference around one point, which then affects the ranking of countries according to the mean scores of happiness and life satisfaction. If we rank countries by mean scores of happiness and life satisfaction, the ranking for some countries differ. Uh, these differences are more evident when comparing more countries as these differences naturally increase. In this analysis, uh, we work with 19 countries, but in some rounds, there are repeated differences uh, of three or four places. It is typically for France or Czechia. Uh, but uh, in round nine and Portugal, there is a big difference of six places. In Portugal, there is also uh, differences of four places in, in round eight. And in the last part of my presentation, I would like to pre I would like to look and present the differences in happiness and life satisfactions. Uh, according to several several characteristics. First, gender. In line with other previous research, uh, it can be concluded that there are no differences in terms of gender. However, in the case of Estonia and, fi or, and Finland, we can see that both women has, have higher levels of happiness and life satisfaction, while in Portugal, it is the opposite. The second is the age. Previous research has reached contradictory results in terms of age, which was also confirmed by my analysis. For most countries, a low negative correlation was found, which means that happiness and life satisfaction level decrease with increasing age. Uh, in contrast, in Nordic countries and United Kingdom, the correlation was slightly positive. Uh, the, the differences are more pronounced for life satisfaction, uh, and this is understandable because, as I uh, as I said in the beginning, uh, the life satisfaction is a more permanent and stable state. The third difference is by education. As the level of education varies across countries, the number of years of education was used uh, for my analysis. Outside, uh, outside uh, Nordic countries, it can be seen that the more years of education a person, a person has, the happier and more satisfies satisfied he or she is in life since a positive correlation was found between these variables. The non-significant differences was, uh, was found in the Nordic countries. Four differences by health. In terms of health status, the results are clear and consistent across all countries as well as in line with previous research. 
simply say better health better health means highest level of happiness and life satisfaction and finally last uh, the differences by employment relation in this respect in this respect research results vary my analysis shown significant differences only in a few countries specifically in denmark and hungary some self-employed workers have higher levels of happiness and life satisfaction scores in addition in in united kingdom poland and portugal people who work in family businesses are the happiest and the most satisfied uh, than other two categories on the contrary uh, employees employees are no more happy or satisfied than other two categories in any country and yeah this and this is the end of my presentation it would be all from me and thank you for your attention and i will look for your questions in the discussion thank you Thank you very much, Radka, for a uh, very interesting topic and uh, some be beautifully presented graphics. Thank you so much. If you would like to leave a question for uh, Radka or for uh, Ricardo, you can still drop these in the Q&A box at any time, and we will get to these when we start the Q&A session at about 2.20ish, maybe a little bit after. Thank you again. Our third talk of the afternoon is from Gilad Berry from the Israeli Ministry of Economy and Industry. Gilad, you have the floor. Thank you, Chair. I'll just share my presentation. Um, do, you, do you see it well? Yes, we see it perfectly. Please continue. Yes, great. So today, um, <coughs> I'm going to speak about uh, uh, values and innovation. First of all, I'll introduce myself. I'm uh, my name is Gilad Beeri, and I'm both uh, director of research at the Ministry of Economy and Industry, and also a PhD candidate in the Hebrew University uh, of Jerusalem. This this project uh, relates a little bit to to both hats, uh, and I'll present today. Uh, a, a paper uh, based on my work with uh, Ohad uh, Maimon, who is my intern here at the ministry. Um, so values and innovation uh, usually are not uh, uh, analyzed uh, together. <laughs> they are uh, usually when economists look at uh, um, uh, innovation, they talk about economic or technological inputs and outputs. Um, but <clears throat> what I want, uh, what, one thing you can uh, get from the uh, from the literature and from the analysis uh, in the classic innovation uh, studies is that innovation is a property that is not distrib distributed equally. And I'll I'll show that uh, from the Israeli uh, point of view, but. It might be more pronounced there, but it it holds also um, broadly to to other uh, countries. And the the, the current uh, study that which I'll, I'll showcase uh, now is that uh, it, it complements this uh, ang from the angle of uh, values or attitudes towards innovation, and we'll see that they are not distributed equally between industries and uh, social groups. So uh, I'll start from the motivation from the policy. I'm, I, I work for the Minister of Economy, as I mentioned. So the, the motivation is a policy, policy one. Um, so Israel, uh, as some of you might know, uh, has a thriving uh, high-tech uh, sector. We have the highest R&D intensity uh, in the world and also uh, in terms of the share of high tech in, in workforce, it's it's 12%. And again, 
uh, the highest in the world. And this uh, sector enjoys uh, higher than OECD average uh, productivity and wages and value added, uh, et cetera. But uh, as, as uh, I many times say, um, uh, the, the reality is not, consist is not uh, being uh, uh, constituent uh, in terms of uh, relative terms, but more by absolute terms. And if you have 12% uh, which uh, uh, work in high tech, you still have 88% that uh, work in other sectors. And then as you can see the, the figure here, uh, on the right, uh, you can see that those other 88% work at below uh, than uh, uh, the average productivity uh, of, of OECD, well below it. So uh, the question is, um, uh, what, what, what happens there? And uh, one of the things that happens there is that the uh, uh, innovation doesn't happen as much as in the thriving high-tech sectors. Uh, so we know from innovation literature that traditional sectors, which are the, what is non-high-tech, leverage different so sources of innovation than, than high-tech. Um, they, uh, they, they rely on adopting existing technologies and also on non-technological modes of innovation uh, with relates, relating to design, to business models, um, marketing, uh, 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 etc. And um, non-technological innovation um, uh, also um, supports uh, adoption of, of technologies because when you adopt a uh, major uh, uh, new technology to, to the company, um, it involves usually a big organizational change, so you need people with uh, open uh, a set of mind. Uh, Israel's innovation strategy and policy is historically focused on uh, high tech, so we also see, as in a different paper, I, I showed that uh, Israel has comparatively low levels of digitalization, i.e., adoption of existing technologies in Israel's te traditional sectors. And then, then the question arises about the second uh, type of innovation relevant to, to those uh, uh, sectors, um, uh, which is the non-technological modes of innovation. And specifically, we, we will focus on today on our, what we sometimes call traditional sectors, think of manufacturing, think of retail, think of construction, do, do those, the employees that work in, in those industries tend to value innovation less, and this could proxy for their, uh, the, the non-technological uh, foundation of uh, uh, innovation in those uh, sectors. So this is <clears throat> this is one outlook based on innovation and productivity point of view. The other lens uh, which are relevant to the, to, to the study that I show today is inclusion policy. So uh, high tech in Israel is relatively homogeneous. As you could see on the, uh, on the figure on the right, um, most of the uh, of this industry is relying on non-ultra orthodox Jews, which uh, basically are not two uh, more uh, traditional links in the labor market chain, uh, which are target for inclusion policy by the government. First is the ultra orthodox community, and secondly, uh, Israeli Arabs uh, co community. And um, the policy efforts are usually focused on what you could call hard skills, meaning education and the ability to uh, program code, uh, etc. But a, a question could be raised about cultural fit to high tech. Um, these are, as I said, traditional uh, communities usually in some sense. Uh, 
and there might be a mismatch in valuing innovation, which is openness to the new. So just looking at, at, at uh, a more abstract way, uh, abstract model uh, uh, of innovation, a relatively simple one, if innovation is basically a function of either capabilities to innovate and motivation to innovate. So on the capability side, you have finance, you have human capital, you have knowledge. This is not what we're going to talk about today. This is what many times what economists um, are, are discussing. Um, we will be talking about the, uh, the branch on the right, which is motivation for innovation. Also here, uh, it could be break down into two external motivations such such as uh, um, monetary incentives to, to innovate. But, and this is what we are going to focus today, is the internal motivation to innovate captured by uh, values. More uh, concretely, the two research question that, that uh, are based on the motivation that I just uh, uh, elaborate on, well, are uh, one, do employees in traditional industries value innovation less than in high tech? And if so, is the difference larger uh, for Israel in a sense that it could explain the dual economy? Or <clears throat> And the second question, uh, do employees from traditional population value innovation less than high tech employees? How, how did, did we do it based on the European social survey? <clears throat> so we, we leveraged an established value theory um, that uh, uh, is uh, established enough to be, um, uh, to be measured in the European social survey from its inception, the Schwarz, theory of basic values. And uh, a, a rich literature establishes two important relationships. One, that a subset of values was found to be associated with innovation, creativity, and business outcomes. Specifically, if we look at this uh, relatively famous a uh, uh, circle model of, of Schwarz values. Uh, specifically, it's the openness to change here uh, on, on the left and conservation uh, on, on the right. Um, as much as, as you, you are higher on openness to change and lower on conservation, it is connected to uh, innovation and creativity and subsequent relevant business outcomes. And also values in general predict cultural fit of employees uh, to organizations. And uh, these two attributes of values uh, make, make uh, uh, Schwarz values um, fit for the two research questions that uh, I, I mentioned. <clears throat> The, uh, regarding uh, uh, um, how the data was operationalized, <laughs> um, so uh, we we used three main uh, blocks of uh, um, variables from the from the survey. First, we have the standard Schwarz value uh, question questionnaire in the uh, in in the implemented in the survey. Um, we have detailed uh, industry data, the two di digit of the uh, standard industrial classification uh, that, that most and all uh, of uh, international bodies work with. And we defined high-tech industries as defined by Israeli Central Bureau of Statistics, which is very close to how the OECD um, uh, identifies them. The Israeli and the Israeli data importantly contains also indication for Israeli Arabs and ultra Orthodox, which we focus on the 2016 uh, uh, data. 
um, because this is the latest data on Israel. Um, and in order to reach large and for high-tech industries, we have aggregated four waves uh, uh, from 2012 to 2018, which all in all, uh, in all those rounds, we have 33 countries, uh, including in Israel in two of the rounds, and uh, we reach almost 200,000 uh, respondents and more than 7,000 respondents from high-tech industries uh, uh, in, in the aggregated data. Um, generally speaking about analysis for the sake of gravity, so we the depend variable is uh, used in other studies uh, is openness to change minus conservation, how much the individual uh, um, uh, values uh, the, the, the set of values related to openness to change minus how much it, he or she uh, values conservation. We, <clears throat> and then we control in all OLS regressions uh, for country and ESS round fixed effects uh, in order to crystallize um, the difference from the average of the country in, in specific uh, point in time. And we also include controls for important demographic variables known to relate to values such as age, gender, and years of education. I won't get into all of the results, but here are uh, some highlights. So pertaining to the first um, uh, research question, um, we, uh, which has to do with the difference in valuing innovation between industries, so uh, the, the results are depicted in the uh, uh, figure we see on the right. Um, it, it depicts the regression results uh, uh, of industry by industry regression when the reference industry, which is the reference line here on the, on the zero, uh, is uh, high-tech industries. So the uh, the numbers or the points here are the uh, regression estimates um, uh, relative to high tech. So you could see a few things here. The I, I didn't mention the the uh, regression here. Results here are for all countries, all the sample. I, I'll refer to the Israel results in a minute. So you could see that all in all, uh, across the sample, traditional sectors such as agriculture, manufacturing, uh, traditional services such as retail or accommodation, um, they, they, are, uh, they have lower um, evaluation of innovation. Um, also public administration, the, the sector that I work for. Uh, you can see also that knowledge intensive services such as finance or other professional services have uh, a similar uh, innovation levels uh, to, to high tech. And you can see that arts for natural reasons is also documented in the literature have higher, uh, uh, is almost the only uh, sector that has higher uh, evaluation of uh, innovation uh, relative to other uh, sectors. So this is from whole of sample uh, perspective. We also ran Israeli on regression that confirmed the same for Israel, but not more than other countries. So the duality in the economy of Israel doesn't have to do with uh, evaluation of innovation. And uh, results are still significant after adding demographic controls, but relationship is weaker, which hints at the role of composition effect, meaning, uh, uh, the people that come to work to, to the to high tech sector um, are, are on the in the first place are more are from demographics that that have higher levels of uh, valuing innovation. Pertaining to the second uh, research question, um, we 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 exhibit uh, a gap uh, in innovation values between ultra orthodox and and sorry, and Israeli uh, Arabs from the average in the population, uh, 
but this difference is even more exacerbated when comparing to high-tech employees. You can see on the right here uh, the magnitude in terms of standard uh, 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 deviations. What are the potential implications uh, for policy? First of all, these are potential implications because this uh, 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 analysis is not causal in nature, but, but more uh, 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 descriptive. Uh, and all in all, it st stresses the importance of soft slash cultural aspects in policy implementation. Um, first, for example, in innovation policy for the traditional sectors that the government, uh, for example, gives grants should support not only a procurement of the technology itself, but also softer aspects relating to uh, consulting the, uh, and making organization, organization more innovation friendly in some sense. Uh, and inclusion policies in high tech should not only include uh, a, 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 a training for high tech skills, but also for cultural differences. This, this pertains both to the individual that wants to go into high tech and also the recruiting uh, high tech uh, uh, companies. And uh, last but not least, uh, I, I want to refer to uh, limitations which uh, chart the way for future direction. First of all, as I mentioned, this is an ob observational study, uh, which causality could not be inferred from, and this could be addressed by utilizing uh, uh, methods such as matching experiments and or uh, lo longitudinal data. Uh, Secondly, this is uh, important for me to say that this is an empirical, not a normative inquiry. I, 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 I shed light on what the values are in those uh, sectors or, or populations. I don't have, uh, uh, it's not a normative inquiry uh, on, on the, uh, the nature of those values. And uh, last but not least, uh, how do these differences in values manifest themselves in the ethical properties of technologies and political involvement of tech employees. Uh, this is a question that goes beyond the economic aspect, and this is a, to be addressed in my PhD project. So thank you. Thank you very much indeed. I found that extremely interesting. And I was pleased to see that there's um, still a strong role for the arts and when it comes to innovation. Thank you very much, Gilad. Uh, can I just take this quick pause to encourage you to put your questions for all our speakers into the Q&A box, and we will come to those after we've heard from our final speaker. Our fourth speaker today is Jonathan Nagani from the University of Oslo. Jonathan, you have the floor. If you'd like to go into presenter mode. Perfect. You can see my presentation? Yes. Thank you, Eric. <clears throat> Good afternoon. My name is Jonathan Moringani. I'm a postdoc at the University of Oslo. I did my PhD at the University of Stavanger. So the paper I'm presenting is a product of the PhD. So I'm going to present on SAS as a catalyst for regional development in a decentralized Europe. The interplay between informal and formal institutions in driving economic growth. So the paper has been published in Regional Science, and I must also thank the investor Stavanga for, for the scholarship for, for me to do my PhD and sponsor the paper, and also for my employer for the generous time in improving the paper. So as you can see that I live in Norway, uh, I'm a Zimbabwean citizen, I was born in Zimbabwe. So Norway and Zimbabwe are fundamentally different societies. So if we travel or live in other parts of the world, we are going to see that societies are fundamentally different. So what you see here is the map of the European Union. And if you can see at the map, you can see that there are different colors and shades. Some of these colors are the same in the same country, but some of the colors are even different in the same country. So this map shows the economic development clubs of the European regions. So the EU, as a group, uh, it has got countries, and within those countries are sub-national regions. And 
these subnational regions, even in the same country, they can also exhibit different forms of growth. So in this case, understanding and explaining regional economic growth requires us to take into account the role of formal and informal institutions. However, empirical studies have not looked at their interplay. So as a result, we don't know how trust affects the economic returns of the quality of regional governments and their autonomy. So I look at institutions and try to see how they influence economic growth. So in terms of institutions, we can take institutions to be the rules of the game, which are humanly devised, which constrain the way we interact, exchange information, and go about our business, but also facilitate the same. So if you look at institutions, there are basically two types of institutions. On the one hand, they are, in, they are formal institutions, which basically refers to officially enforceable rules. And on the other hand, they are informal institutions, which refer to social rules enforced outside the official channels. So for instance, if you don't trust another person or the government, you cannot be arrested. But if you over speed, you can be arrested. So, that, so, over, so the control of speed in, in societies, that's a formal institution. So in terms of formal, formal institutions, I look at the quality of government and the decentralization or regional authority. In terms of social institutions or informal institutions, I look at first. So as you can see, I've put some books here, it's just uh, exemplars. Uh, they, are not the, they are not the only favorite uh, scholars that are, I, I've looked at, but uh, at least they are the ones uh, where I think there are some disagreements. So if we take that point, it will bring us to the argument. So in this case, we want to look at the interplay between formal institutions and informal institutions. And this basically look at how trust affects the returns of quality of government and regional authority. So we can take trust to be the expectation we have for other people or impersonal objects like institutions that they act as expected. And there are several forms of trust. And today, I'm going to talk about the trust we give to strangers, which is also called social trust or the generalized trust. So this trust is different from the trust that Ricardo spoke about, which is institutional trust. So the understanding is that the trust we give to strangers allows us to be tolerant. It also allows us to come together in terms of collective action but also it allows us to, uh, to reduce the information asymmetry because we cannot know everything about everyone. If we're going to do business with them, we must at least trust them. But also it reduces transaction costs. So as we go about our everyday business or our everyday activities, we might have a situation where we might want to rely on the law to enforce certain contracts. But if we trust each other, that might be less. So that makes business easier and interaction easier, which means we will free resources for productive activities, but also trust in itself, it presents primitive accumulation because everybody knows that, okay, at least if I pay my tax, it will be spent well. If I do this, other people also do the same. So there's an expectation that we can all do good things. And all these mechanisms, if a positive effect on economic growth. So we hypothesize that first is a positive effect on economic growth. Second, I look at decentralization and in particular self-rule. So there's an argument that self-rule, if people within a region or a locality are able to make their own policies and are, and are able to form their own local government, that brings government to the people. So that means if policies are being made, these policies are made within the context where they matter. But also at the same time, if people can participate in their locality, that means it increases their ability to do things. You know, you become consciously, 
you, you become unconsciously competent at doing things. The more you do them, the better you become. Like whether you're riding a bicycle as a young person or whether you, you become a driver as an adult. So the idea is that decentralization or the devolution has got a positive impact on economic growth. However, the findings to this effect are mixed. We then suggest that we need to look at under what conditions does this happen? And one of the conditions that we're interested in looking at is trust. So we hypothesize that trust mediates the impact of decentralization on economic growth, which means as much as we decentralize, if anything is going to happen, it is because of whether people trust each other in that locality that we can drive economic growth. And lastly, I look at quality of government. So quality of government here refers basically to the control of corruption that the government has, its effectiveness, but also the degree of fairness to which it is perceived in doing what it does. And lastly, the role of voice and accountability. So are citizens able to participate in their government and make it accountable? So if these things happen, it means if a government is accountable, there will be less corruption. It will probably spend money where it matters most. But also, if people think that they are fairly treated, that means all of them will also be enticed to pay tax. So while empirical evidence suggests that the quality of government leads to economic growth, its interaction with trust remains assumed. So we have not seen studies that have looked at how trust at a regional level affects that. And that's what we are going to find. So I take you to the data. So in this paper, I looked at 208 subnational regions uh, at NAS1 and NAS2 level. So why at NAS1 and NAS2 level? Because yeah, the interest is also to look at regions that have got a regional autonomy. So where people have got a local self-government that decides what they do. And I look at these regions, uh, I look at these uh, in 21 countries from 2002 to 2000 to 2016. So this is a panel data analysis. So in this case, I look at economic growth and we use the natural log of uh, GDP. So people then say, but economic growth is not uh, economic development and there are, there are all these kind of arguments. But uh, basically, yeah, we are interested in, in the long-term economic growth. So we can use levels of GDP instead of the rate of GDP, although they're, they're the best that effect. Then for the independent variables, I looked at trust and I used trust from the European Social Survey. So the European Social Survey has got three questions on trust. So there's a question on whether you can trust other people, which is people trust, and also a question whether you think people can be fair, they want to be fair, or, and also a question on whether you can help other people. So when these questions are looked at, with, I used the factor analysis to see whether they can be explained by one variable. In other words, can they be explained by one factor? So can they be explained by trust? And the loadings show us that they can be explained by trust. And I further test them using a Kronbach's alpha to see whether the, the tests are reliable and consistent. And I see that the measures are above 0 0.7. And I also do the same with a KMO test and I see the same, the same results. So, all these factors, all these questions on trust, uh, on people, whether they can be fair, they can help each other and they can trust other people, they, they, they are all explained by one variable called trust, which is social trust. Then the, the next variable is the quality of government. So we use the data from the European Quality of Government Index. Uh, I also want to thank Professor Sharon for supplying the data. So, so this data is got data for 2010, 2013. It's about three years data that I got, uh, but because it's not as, uh, as biannual as uh, the ESS survey, I used the World Government Indicator, which has got data for almost every, every second year to, to extend it. Then lastly, I used the Regional Authority Index data from Shaki and Hack and, and, and Og. So for the control variables, I used the R&D expenditure, uh, human capital, employment, and also the natural log of population density and natural log of road accessibility. 
Like I said, this is a panel data analysis where we're using the, the national log of GDP. Uh, then we look at first quality of government and decentralization, but also we, we have got other control variables and we look at the fixed effects as well as the, the, the error term. In other words, there could be other things that we can't explain, but we try to explain as much. That's the mod main model. Then we have a second model where we test the second hypothesis, how fast mid or mid years decentralization. So in this case, we use an interaction term. Right, you can see there's a star here, which means we're interacting them. Same applies to 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 trust and and the quality of government. So the results, uh, I'll start by showing the descriptive results. So if you look at my maps, so the first map is on on trust or social trust. The second map is on quality of government. We can see that the areas so. The, the, the blue, like the blue peninsula, that, that's the, the Scandinavian, that, that's the Sweden and Norway. So we can see that the blue here in Sweden largely also reflects the blue in Sweden. Same applies to, to other parts of uh, Western Europe, whether it's UK or it's the, it's the continental Europe, German Netherlands. But we can also see if we go further down, we have got the Italy here, where there's a clear difference between the North and the South. And we, and we, we somehow see almost kind of the same difference. Then if you look at uh, quality of government and the GDP, we see that the two are positively correlated. So I'll quickly go to the, to the main results on the, the regression. So here we, we demonstrate that first indeed uh, influence the economic growth. So, so the same applies to quality of government, but we see nothing for decentralization. If we go to the next one and look at the interaction, we interact fast in decentralization and we get a negative uh, significant result. The same applies when you also interact fast in the quality of government, we get a negative, very significant result. So if you look at fast in decentralization, as much as the result is negative and, and significant, we have to be very, be very careful. So. We cannot conclude that uh, trust and decentralization are substitutes or that the uh, that trust is mediating the returns on decentralization. So we have to plot these results. So I go on to plot the results. And here I focus uh, more on I focus on so on the plot. So this is the quality of government and trust. So we can see that as we increase uh, the, the level of trust there's a change in the quality of government, right? Which suggests that uh, the, the quality of government is mediated by trust, or trust influences the effect of quality of government on economic growth. However, the story is different when you look at, uh, the story is different when you look at uh, quality of government and decentralization. So I'm trying to move my slides here. So here, when you look at the graph between decentralization and quality of government, although the graph is negative, it does not go beyond zero. So in other words, there's no effect. So no matter how much we, we increase the level of trust, we get no effect from or, or decentralization. So there's no substitute effect here. So that brings us to the conclusion to say that uh, we say that to explain regional economic growth, we need to understand both formal and informal institutions. However, as we said, the previous studies have not looked at the interactions. So we find that you know, while both institutions matter, specifically trust substitutes the quality of regional government, but does not affect the economic impact of its degree of decentralization. So the implication here for policy is that policymakers need to think creatively about harnessing institutions to promote economic growth and perhaps devise and implement interventions that can either generate trust or improve the quality of government. So to generate trust, they need to encourage the role of civil society, but to improve the quality of government, the government themselves need to play a role. So this, in a way, closes the debate on what is important, formal or informal institutions. It's clear that both play a role. So which means depending when one, when one is low, a change or intervention on the other side 
would definitely improve the prospects for economic growth. So the study is only about limitation. So our study was mainly descriptive and we don't make cause or claims because we're not necessarily interested in whether trust or part of government affects economic growth, but how trust mediates part of government decentralization. But also the research itself looked at one type of decentralization and also did not look at nonlinear effects, which means other future researchers would possibly look at these areas. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jonathan. A very original, interesting paper. So everyone, it's now a little bit after 2.20 in the afternoon. Uh, so I'm going to ask all the paper givers to uh, come onto the virtual stage at the front of the room um, so that you're uh, in vision to uh, take questions. So um, before I move to the Q&A box, I see that um, we have a raised hand. So I presume this might be a question. Uh, this is Akim. I've unmuted you, Akim, if you'd like to ask a question. Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, it was a mistake that I raised my hand, but I don't have a question, but uh, just a, a small comment to the uh, presentation from the Czech colleague. I think it was one of the uh, figures was really an impressive example to show uh, what the uh, uh, switch in data collection mode might mean for ESS time series. When I saw it correctly, there were five countries where we saw a sharp drop in uh, the average life satisfaction and happiness. And all these five countries were countries where, which made a switch from face-to-face uh, -face interviewing to self-completion. So I think this is a clear hint that these two items are uh, prone to be affected by the mode because I couldn't see for the other countries a similar drop. Only in Portugal, I think there was a slight drop for one of the two indicators, but all the other countries which stick to face to face did not show such a drop. So this is some kind of an evidence for candidates for of questions which were might be affected by the modes which ESS is going to uh, do in the upcoming rounds. Thank you. Okay, I think that it is more general question about switching the mode of data collection. Um, as I am informed properly, the European Social Survey have have some consultant for switching the mode, but but yes, uh, in these countries where there were evident uh, a drop in happiness and life satisfaction, in only in these countries was the uh, the data collection was switching. So probably there will be a, a effect of data collection. Yeah, thank you. That's clear. Uh, thank you, Radka, and uh, thank you, Akim. Even if that was an accidental hand, it was a, a good question and a good answer. Yes, it's an intriguing prospect, isn't it? Uh, one possibility being that respondents are um, more inclined not to fake their happiness when faced with a, a cheery face of an interviewer, but uh, all that remains, of course, to be, to be worked out. Uh, Martin, I will come to you in a second, but we have a question uh, already um, lodged in the Q&A from Isabella. This is for you, Ricardo. Uh, it simply asks, did you look into mother's education degree and effect on children's uh, construction attitude vis-a-vis -vis the, the state and institutions? 
So thank you for your question. Yeah, um, we did check that. Uh, we do not find the corresponding effects, but so just to, uh, as the one we find for father's education. Our interpretation of that is that the uh, the fa father's educational attainment is more of a is a better proxy probably for the uh, socioeconomic status of the household as a as a whole, especially since we are considering interviews going as back as uh, as far back as twenty years ago. Uh, but no, we do not find heterogeneity by the mother's uh, educational uh, attainments. So if if that is the question. Thank you. Uh, Martin. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, indeed. Your question, please. I'm, I'm here, I'm in, in, in South Africa, and I'm quite interested in the, in the stuff that the, the European Social Service has been doing pioneering work on, on trust and policing. And so the, my question is to, to, to the two speakers that looked at trust, because I'm quite interested in how trust that's accrued in one domain or one kind of social domain interaction translates or is liquid across other sectors. So in other words, how does trust in policing, for example, translate into economic growth? Or how does um, trust in, in the military, for example, um, link to trust in policing or trust in the, in the political system? I'm just interested in how, how fluid and how interinstitutional trust is, or is it very domain specific? Thank you. Maybe I can start, then Ricardo can come later. So, so thank you, Martin. Uh, so obviously, thank you for uh, speaking also from that part of the world. Yeah. So my my PhD focused mainly on social at first and also on political at first. So I've got a forthcoming paper on political at first. So first, like I said, uh, all first in general it can be explained as our experience way for others. But then you know that there are different types of first, like you 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 rightly said now that there is. This trust, social trust, and, and political and institutional trust. So for social trust, the argument is that if you trust other people that you don't know, you're likely to buy from them. So in other ways, it increases because you don't need more information about them because you just trust people anyway. So, so in other ways, it addresses information asymmetry. The fact that you lack information about them does not stop you from doing business with them. So that encourages your economic activities, which in a way implies economic growth. But also think of it on the other hand. If you think of forming a Kanban, you have to trust other people, right? These people may not necessarily be your family. There are people outside your family, but you have to trust that they're going to be good employees. They're going to be good shareholders. So that way we can also say that trust encourages the formation of economic organization. That's the argument by Fukuyama. Then when you come to the other things where we talked about the transition costs. So if you're, in a, if you're doing business in any country, you are likely to think that if somebody defrauds you, you can take them to court. But if 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 you trust, or there's I trust in that kind of, of people to people, that people that means people are likely to, to defraud you. So in other words, that thing it reduces your cost of doing business. So if your cost of doing doing business reduced, it means you now have freed your resources to productive activities. So the money you spend chasing people in courts is the money you are now spending investing in your company or investing in your time. Which increase the economic productivity. Now, then, when you come to 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 to, to institutional first, which is like political first in a way, it depends on how we want to define first. So, but I'll leave that to Ricardo to 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 broaden a bit. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, Martin, and thank you, Jonathan. Um, yeah, I mean, I just want to add on. I I, I mean, I, I I just wanted to add that relating to our project. What we study is indeed trust towards the democratically elected institution or the trust towards those institutions that are more representative of uh, the democratic part of state. While of course the army and uh, police, but in particular the army represents sort of a very strange animal within, within democratic state. And so the point that we try to make is that uh, the, the, the transfer between patriotism and trust towards this institution is kind of a very 
is kind of a very complex one because the point is that trust towards the military could transfer into transfer into trust towards the country, towards the democratic institution as a whole. But on the other side, trust towards the military can also become trust towards a way of ruling, a way of administering things, a way of managing the polity that is completely different from the one that is being in, in that is in place in the country in democratic context. And so we argue that trust was the military, if pushed too far, may also clash. And this is not what we ask. I mean, this is, this is not what we argue. It's something that's been there in the literature for, for years now. There is this clash between trust was military institution and trust was democratically elected institution. And this is actually what we try to capture in, in our paper. Then this trust towards other people, which is a kind of a classic question that's been asked in the European Social Survey. We do not find any effect on trust towards the other. The effect we capture is really trust towards the institution and what they represent. So I think we have these three kind of layers, trust towards other citizens, towards the military institution, towards democratic institution. What we can do with the ESS is look at this first and third element, what happens on the second element is something that we kind of um, impute from the literature and also from the result to get in our in our paper. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we have a couple more. So one that's come in directly uh, is a question for, for Gillard. Um, so in the paper, you uh, look at the relationship between sort of innovatory values and and industrial sector, basically, sort of type of work. Uh, the question is basically, have you done or thought of doing a similar type of exercise, but on not on sector, but on the, uh, the hierarchical occupational structure? So in other words, sort of questioning the idea that innovation um, and risk-taking is, is sort of preeminent amongst the people in the, the upper reaches of the structure, or can innovation be all the way through the occupational structure. Thank you very much for, for the, the question. Uh, yes, indeed, that, that within the, 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 the paper that I presented today, but actually within the first paper, uh, within the framework of my uh, PhD uh, uh, dissertation, uh, we, we look from the uh, uh, occupational uh, standard classification, which the ESS is one of, I think, uh, uh, one of the only international uh, multi-country surveys that operationalizes both industry by the ISIC classification and uh, occupation by the ISCO a classification, which is the uh, standard classification for occupations. And uh, yes, uh, we, we find, um, we find uh, similar uh, patterns to what we saw here. Uh, generally speaking, um, uh, people that, that work at technological uh, occupations, uh, again, using standard definitions, um, they, they tend to value higher um, uh, values pertaining to innovation. Uh, and uh, they, and they, they are si similar, sim mostly similar to other um, uh, professional uh, occupations. Uh, but uh, there are some dissimilarities not not with 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 regards to uh, f first first they are usually on the higher end of the of of those uh, 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 this strata and uh, and also we in the phd we we I, I look not only on values pertaining to innovation but also the other axes uh, that are operationalized in uh, uh, Schwartz values um, theory uh, the self transcendent self enhancement and and we see some some uh, dissimilar 
uh, tendencies uh, to other uh, profi professional uh, uh, elites. I, I, I'll be happy to, to, to discuss that uh, uh, offline uh, due to, to keep my feedback uh, concise. So this this is the, the so all in all yes uh, we see similar uh, similar trends. Thank you. Uh, this is another one for you, Ricardo, um, from Daphne. Uh, for the paper on trust and military conscription, uh, as it's reasonable that conscription could stop because the state could afford payment to professionals, is there any way of controlling for the size of the army? Thank you very much, Daphne. Uh, no, that's a, that's a fair point. I mean, one of the reasons why conscription was stopped, actually, it was just because the, these voluntary military services had become so expensive that many states decided it was too much, especially each, given the changing dynam warfare dynamics uh, that, have, that have dramatically evolved since the end of of, of the Cold War. My answer to that is that I think the point on the military uh, on military spending is relevant, but not exactly for the identification strategy we employ in our paper. Because if you remember, we compare people that were just eligible. So let's say they were 18 the year after the reform to people that were 18 the year before the reform. And so ideally, I mean, and what we try to capture is to compare the same socioeconomic background of the individual, the same political level of attitudes, the same level, the same uh, political attitudes, but also the same circumstances. So what we will expect is that the level of military spending and the, level, the budget of the state in these two years hadn't changed much and compare backgrounds that are as similar as possible, except for whether being old enough or just young enough to avoid conscription. So, in, ideally, in our study, we are comparing people that were facing the same background. And what we use as an identification strategy is the randomness or the exogeneity, so to say, of the reform date compared to the birth of the uh, respondent or actually the year in which the respondent became just eligible or not for the for for the conscription so the timing of the reform is of course a function of a lot of uh, a lot of, of strategic decision making from the state uh, depending also on the budget but the birth of the respondent at the individual level we argue it's not a function or not related to the timing of the reform, which is, as you said correctly, a function of a number a number of factors we cannot control for. Thank you very much. And there's uh, another question. Uh, this question is also for uh, Galad. Um, the question is, um, this is from uh, Quadwo. Uh, can you explain further uh, what you use the human values variable to explain in the study. Did you test the dimensions of the Schwartz value model on innovation in various industries or, or what was done? Could you elaborate a little bit, please? Yes, so the um, in this paper, um, the main uh, dependent variable of interest, as I mentioned, was um, a relatively high level aggregated um, uh, indicator, which is, as I mentioned, was um, uh, the how much an individual um, uh, values openness to change, which is one of the four higher level uh, uh, values in, in Schwartz theories, theory, sorry. Um, minus uh, how the individual um, values uh, conservation, which is the opposite in, in the model, and are, they are both measured in the, uh, in the survey, as, and as in other surveys, uh, in other soil studies, um, uh, this, this uh, 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 indicator could serve as some kind of summative uh, indicator for how much individual values the the concept uh, of innovate of innovation. Um, I 
we also did some some secondary analysis based on each of those uh, uh, separately uh, um, and also going down into the 10 uh, uh, value groups that that are under uh, uh, the Schwartz uh, uh, for for higher level values and the the, the results are kind of uh, uh, kind of the the same so uh, for the sake of um, uh, being concise we we uh, the, the main we maintain the main dependent variable to be this more uh, aggregated higher level, uh, as I mentioned, the difference between uh, how much individual values openness to change minus how much individual um, uh, values uh, conservation, which is the opposite. So this is why the negative, uh, the negative sign. So I hope that, that uh, that clarifies a bit. Thank you very much indeed. Um, and we've got time to take another question. This one came in directly. It's for Radka. Um, so you demonstrated in your in your graphs um, the, the the classic um, U shape of uh, of life satisfaction through age groups, albeit a, a relatively shallow one. And the question is simply: uh, Did you have enough sample n? to see whether this um, shallow U uh, holds up for both men and for women and for people with, say, different health or educational experiences. Is that possible? Uh, I didn't this analysis exactly, but from my experiences and, uh, uh, re and uh, previous result as well, um, I don't suppose that there would be differences in both and women in the in the connection with the age because previous research didn't find any differences in terms of gender in general. So I suppose that the impact uh, of gender on the age differences in age uh, also uh, won't be. This is uh, my. Uh, what I supposed. Thank you. Yes, just off the top of my head, it's interesting to speculate on the interaction that this might have with health, though, given the uh, link that you showed between sort of health and happiness, and given that health outcomes are a uh, um, not exactly a lottery, but they vary. They vary particularly in the later years of life. So that's quite an intriguing speculation. But I, I guess we. We uh, don't have any more evidence to talk about that here. So uh, thank you all very much uh, for some very interesting material. Thank you for making such interesting and imaginative use of European Social Survey time series data. Thank you to everybody who's joined us from around Europe and uh, around the world. Um, so once again, I thank everybody and wish you a good afternoon.